I'm very humbled to be allowed to uh, stand up on the stage together with such uh, fabulous speakers, uh, not only in this event, but all the other events as also Innovation Week as well. So I hope you'll like my contribution. And um, my talk has two parts to it. The first part is I want to make you uh, reflect on whether or not you have a good balance between keeping an eye on this huge shifting technology landscape uh, versus keeping an eye on the people that will purchase uh, your products and services in them. And the other half, I will try to talk a bit about and show you a bit why I believe that those of you working in the, the corporate world have it a bit tougher to find that balance than those of you working in these nimble startups. As a bonus, if we have time, I'll even show you um, a hint to some methodology for such um, balance. So. This is me, uh, Jürgen. I'm a designer, uh, but most of my uh, career I've spent my creative powers designing businesses uh, as a CEO for uh, a startup, which ended up being uh, um, fusioned into eggs, and also as a CEO for a development company um, where I sat on the board strategizing retail distribution, uh, both in the Nordics and globally. And I have some experience uh, bringing new to the market. Uh, I think uh, in that role, I uh, we released on average uh, two products every week and one brand every other month for four years consecutively. So um, quite a lot of production. I was part of some fantastic teams that got um, awards both for design but also got accredited for, for innovation. So, um, and also then uh, Eggs Design, which is hosting you today, uh, has some interesting facets with this because we are entrepreneurs and I think um, it sets it apart that we are we have had startup growth since our founding. Our employees, they often come from startups and they often leave to join startups. And we have a considerable portfolio of startups in our client base. And we also invest in startups, some of which you see below here. Um, yet about 70% of our revenue, more or less, comes from the corporate world. So hence my job uh, at Eggs is uh, to be head of what we call corporate startup, helping established corporations innovate like the entrepreneurs, like startups. So, I guess this week you'll be hearing this word a lot, change. What do we do about it? How do we meet it? And it's interesting about change that when you talk um, about change in your lifetime, so there's, a, there's this natural tendency to view change in your surroundings, uh, I wouldn't say as a linear if you look at it across decades, but at least it's this slow acceleration. If, if you were to tell the story about the change in the world that you've experienced in your um, lifetime, and looking at how young and beautiful you all are, I'm assuming that's about 35 to 45 years from the 80s and up. And that change, if you were to tell that story, um, I think it would kind of feel like this graph. Yes, there would be jumps. I mean, um, I don't know if you remember getting cable TV, at least I. I remember going to my neighbor to watch cable TV. Uh, I remember distinctly my neighbor getting a soda stream. Very envious of that. Um, I can almost remember the first time I actually had a productive result of the internet, which is probably this millennia, actually, for my part. Uh, I remember my first phone. And, but so all these changes, huge changes uh, for humanity, yet somehow to me, they didn't feel very um, scary. And I didn't get nervous about it. Whereas the graph that we're depicting this week, that we're all celebrating and talking about, um, kind of looks like this. It's a different graph. It feels like change is going so fast these days. And we get proof. We get proof in uh, all sorts of different um, um, statistics like this. I, I can't vouch for the numbers here. There's like 10 different versions of these graphs out there right now. But it's saying that if we look at the change that in the people around us, how they adopt, how they change behavior, it's exponential. And um, there are, um, uh, it's, it's kind of scary. And this graph is what becomes this digital wave that we borrowed as a title even for this event. And if you're a business, and let's assume that uh, these boats out there is, is maybe your business, then you're facing this wave and it's no wonder that that might seem a bit scary because, you know, it, it could get really bad. And around you, and especially if your boat is an old one, maybe your boat was built for calmer waters and calmer times. Um, and now you're facing this wave, and around you, 
not even having a boat, I mean, swimming literally immersed in the ocean, are these other people sort of singing shanties and saying that this change, that the wave that we're looking at, it's a good thing. I mean, uh, and they're singing songs. Uh, I put, put an old Nobel laureate up there. Mind you, it's a 50-year-old song, still true today. Um, and we'll talk about these guys uh, immersed in the water uh, a bit later and get back to that. But um, let's have a look at this proof again, because there is something very specific about this graph. I think, um, I think you even said it, that there are lots of waves moving around. They're going in all directions. And this graph that we're looking at, it's, it's a very specific one. It's a, it comes from a specific viewpoint, a specific perspective. It comes from a very tech perspective. In fact, it's even more specific. It comes from a digital spec, uh, tech perspective. And now, I'm not saying that there isn't a profile change in pace in the technological development of the, in the world and in other technologies as well. And I'm not undermining the, um, the impact that I believe that this change has on our world. But I am wanting to comment on how productive it is um, to be very, very mindful of this specific graph. And especially if you're developing new value propositions um, or making decisions on new value propositions. So, because I believe that in the realm of business, um, in the realm of doing business today, I get a feeling that this somehow becomes very dominant and it's even connected to a slight bit of panic. And <clears throat> I believe it's stealing focus from something that's been uh, talked about by many, nearly all of our speakers today, except Irun, of course, um, that um, there is taking away focus from uh, what I believe is maybe the most important uh, purpose of a business. Because if you are making tech, if you are selling tech, of course, keeping a mindful eye on the changing capabilities of tech is extremely important. But if you, like uh, Peter Drucker would put it, if you're in the business of creating a customer, well, then you need to keep a close eye on what this change means for people. Because I truly believe that the real challenge is to be aware of this increased speed of change also in people and try to single out, and this is the tough part, what change is actually relevant to your domain. And um, I think that for a lot of you, a lot of you out here, um, uh, if you want to keep your eye on a ball, the right ball to keep an eye on is probably your, the people and not tech. I I brought this graph because I, I just saw it this week, and it's, it was launched in uh, last year, I think, by Thomas Friedman, who's a columnist, a U.S. columnist, in, in a book that he wrote. And it's been getting quite a bit of criticism on, online because it's interesting. It talks about um, human beings, people, uh, technology, rate of change, and, and the, the current situation. And I think it's, uh, I think it's so full of faults, and, and it's gotten a lot of criticism online as well. But it's, it's interesting because it sort of shows the viewpoint of technology where it's a claim that we are now, um, this wave that we're talking about is producing technology faster than uh, human beings' that ability to adapt to it. So you, <laughs> you would basically say, that, and move past it even. It's claiming that we're, we're already past uh, in terms of technology. And there are so many things about this graph. Uh, one thing is, of course, if you look at this area here, I, I would say um, technology that human beings don't adapt to, is it even interesting? I think not. It, what is that? That's, that's the beta video recorder or something. So I think if this was true, I mean, we would be looking at a graph that was like this. So technology would naturally just slow because it would keep pace with humans' ability to adapt. And that was limited. It's a lie. It's not like that at all, of course. What we are seeing is, of course, that human beings are incredibly adaptable. Now, evolution would even have it that we're the most adaptable species on Earth. And I think it's obvious that the graph will look something like this we will soak up this technology and we will find ways of using it. But I think the key takeaway here is that the reason we will do it is because it will be enabled by relevant value. I mean, we will, make, we will adapt the technology that is relevant, giving us value. And also, it will be enabled by great design. So you will only be able to adapt the technology that is designed in a way that allows you to use it. So this is kind of the takeaway for this. So how do you design relevant value in such a tech framework? Well, again, by keeping an eye on the people ball. So if you go back to this wave and uh, this landscape, and we talked about uh, the boats being the businesses and some, some people as well who don't even have a boat singing these shanties that this change is, is good. And who are those people? Well, those people are startups. And this graph to them represents opportunity. 
So basically, they have an idea. They are immersed in the ocean. They, are, they have an idea, and they've gotten that idea because they are so immersed in the here and now, and their job is to build the boat that will allow them to, to surf this wave. However, if you're in a boat already, you're an established business. This wave represents a challenge. And the company basically is wondering, will my boat be able to handle this wave? And um, some of them might panic, but most of them don't. Many companies used to do this. So basically, they, they get what I call um, uh, decision paralysis. So it becomes so scary to change the current business model so that you end up not doing a change at all and uh, stagnating. However, what I'm feeling today in the client base that we have here at Eggs is that this isn't really what's happening to, to the businesses. What's happening is that these businesses are suddenly now almost scourging, searching all over the place for opportunities. They're starting many, many different sort of initiatives, um, and they are sort of um, spending, exploding, and their focus is dissolving in their hunt for this disruption. And I think what they're seeing is that it becomes evident that this company, it will not die of starvation for new ideas. It will die drowning in the abundance of ideas. And then they're sort of glimpsing, looking over at these startups over there. They, 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 seem, it's, they become envious, and it's, they're doing something right. What is it? It's, it's really bad. They're, 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 just, they're just so focused, so dedicated. And what is it? Is it something about what they're focusing on? And then somebody typically high up comes and says, well, we ought to be like those guys, which is a problem, of course, because very few could actually tell you what really is a startup and especially what makes a successful startup. And uh, this is, I'm going to make an effort to try to point out what I feel is one of the main differences between the established and the startups, and it comes to the focus on people. I'm going to do that through a history lesson. And um, most of us here were kids once, and believe it or not, many established corporations were once startups. So I'm going to do this uh, hypothetical travel uh, where we'll talk to this inventor who basically is talking to people, and while doing that, gets idea. She talks to people mostly because it's natural, probably due to some line of work or her hobbies, and she sees an unmet need, and she formulates a value proposal, and she starts a business around it. And she has some very good assets because basically she's extremely close to her users. She has her finger on their pulse. She knows their shifting moods. She knows the change in them. And she can develop her offering knowing that it gives relevant value. And she can take decisions knowing that she will keep on ensuring this relevant value. And most likely, those decisions will kind of feel not that risky because she has first-hand knowledge. Of course, her idea is a good one, and she hires some help and becomes a startup. So she hires somebody to help her develop and somebody to help her market her proposal. And this little tight-knit team is still extremely close to her user base, ensuring that they're developing uh, relevant uh, value propositions. And she's, um, the decision maker is embedded in the team. So basically, again, it's first-hand knowledge making the decisions. And most likely, those decisions don't feel that risky. But as the company grows, um, literally becoming a growth company, um, what we see is that this team, they're still very close to the users. They are still working with them and ensuring that they're delivering relevant value. But the, but the founder, the decision maker, is preoccupied funding this company, growing this company, and the distance to the users become more um, longer. And what she's feeling now is that she's feeling that she gets uh, to make decisions, but there's this nagging uncertainty about it. She's starting to feel a new kind of risk that's connected to the way she manages innovation. And as the company grows and becomes this small and medium business, the SMB, um, what she does now is this company needs to get better at um, needs to get better at organizing, becoming more efficient. Some of the things that you do is you typically divide uh, the people making new value propositions from the people who is responsible for settling your current value propositions. And um, you get a board, typically, to advise you. And what happens here is that these guys over here, the guys marketing and selling value propositions, they tend to make this barrier to the users because the poor users over there, they have very limited attention spans. It's you guys. And um, these guys are scared that 
they ought to be buying our current value proposition. And if these guys come and talk about the next one, they'll just wait for the next release. So, and we're desperate. We need to grow. I mean, this company is still a young company. We need to sell our products. So you get these barriers, and what happens is that these guys, they end up trying to make the new, their value propositions more based on old knowledge, or even worse, based on themselves. And then as for the decision makers, they are even now getting third-hand information filtered through all these people trying to make decisions. It becomes very risky because um, who's to say what is the right decision? They no longer are in contact with the end user. This company then becomes a huge enterprise uh, after a while, and you get all sorts of uh, hierarchies. Uh, our in, uh, our um, inventory is replaced by a professional CEO. They're held accountable by shareholders, and you get all sorts of problems again. These hierarchies make it even tougher to stay on top of users uh, when developing your new value propositions, and it becomes completely hopeless for decision makers to have any contact with the users knowing what makes a good decision. And this leads to what we talked about earlier, this uh, decision paralysis. So, uh, now if, if you was to um, emulate a startup then, if you wanted to retain some of that nimbleness that you see in the beginning, uh, my, my five cents is that you ought to do these three things. You ought to stay relevant and informed. And that goes particularly for your decision makers. You need to stay on top of users and, and make sure that you observe and understand what makes value for them because that's the only way you'll be able to make uh, decisions fast. And then you need to get a garage. Well, you need to create a team and a place for that team that, that makes them feel free to take the road less travel. Now, hierarchy is one of the big things you want to escape from. I'm not saying that you need to create a new company, but they need to be separate. Lastly, you need to set these guys free. And you've got to give autonomy to them. And I think that the good thing about takeaway number one is that these guys will create value, meaningful value, if they follow takeaway one. The other part is that if you as a manager, as a decision maker, follow uh, takeaway one, you will actually recognize when you are presented with a case of real value, and you'll be able to make that decision. And that's the cue, right? That's what makes um, the value proposition flourish. Somebody actually decides to do it. So this is my takeaway. And I think, uh, what's my time? Is it, I'm at zero more or less? Okay, so I'm gonna, I won't have time for the, bonus, for the bonus part, except to say that what we've been talking about now is what I call the premises for innovation. Um, all the business books you're reading about, um, they are mostly about processes for innovation. And I just wanted to say one last thing, and that is that innovation models, they are like buses. If you miss one, there's always gonna come along another one in 10 minutes. But what is important is that they can give you a new point of view. And as Alan Kay once said, that a point of view is worth 80 IQ points. So I'm a huge fan of that, and I'm not going to be talking about the methods that we would want to do now, but um, I hope you can talk to me about that later. Thank you.